that. And so this is what a Sunday morning service here looks like. This is great. No, it's, it's funny. A lot of y'all probably see me. I like, I like to try to pop my head in here at least for a couple minutes every Sunday morning. You might see me stand in the back or up in the balcony just for a few minutes. I try to try to do that as I, you know, we're with B Sunday School, we're split up. A lot, some of our classes are downstairs this direction, and some of our classes are in the far reaches of the property over in that direction, and the auditorium's right here in the middle. So it gives me an opportunity sometimes to stop by here for a couple minutes and just, just see what, what's going on and what Lord's doing here. So, but man, it is, it is my privilege to be able to stand here this morning. I know pastor's gone, and, and, uh, and, and I know that... Um, uh, that in fact, actually, if you are here and this is maybe your first time here with us, would you just hang on <laughs> and come back next Sunday? And I know Pastor Raven would love to get the opportunity uh, to meet you all. And in fact, actually, uh, what I, I did want to say this as well: if you're here and you've you've not been attending very long, or or maybe uh, let's be honest, maybe you have, and and I just you and I just haven't had the chance to meet personally, face to face. Uh, my wife is here uh, with me this morning in, in the auditorium as well. And, and it would be our pleasure, uh, our privilege, really, to be able to get a chance uh, to, to be able to meet you. And we'll, we'll post out there in the foyer. And would you do us the, the, the privilege uh, of, of coming by and just introducing yourselves to us? I don't get the chance often. I get to see lots of faces on Sunday mornings, but I don't get the chance often to actually greet you and meet you. And so I would love to be able to do that. And so we'll be out there uh, after the service. But let's go ahead and turn this morning to the 91st Psalm. Pretty much, if you just kind of open your Bible by the halfway point, you should maybe fall into the book of Psalms. And, and we'll be in the 91st Psalm here in just a couple of minutes. Nine, Psalm 91. But, you know, when you and I, we use the word priceless. Y'all remember the, it was a MasterCard, I guess. I didn't look, look it up. The commercials, the ad campaign that they ran a while back about the, you know, hot dog at the stadium, $14, time spent with dad, prices, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, when we think of that word, let me ask you this. What item or maybe some items that you possess that you'd use to describe its worth to you? Is there anything in your possession that you own that's become so valuable to you that there's really probably no amount of money that you'd be able to take it off of your hands? Generally speaking, yeah, I'm not really, a, I don't tend to be a, 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 a sentimental type of person. But there's one item that I own that when I use this term priceless, comes to mind. And it's this little pocket knife. And, you know, it's not really worth a whole lot. You could probably buy one almost just like it at Walmart for a few dollars. But this is my grandpa's pocket knife. You know, he's gone, his, he's ran his race, he's completed his course, he was a faithful Christian, and he stepped into eternity a few years ago, and this is one thing that, that I have to remember him by. And so it's valuable, not just because of intrinsic worth, there's nothing particularly special about it, but because of what he meant to me. You know, it's, it's, that was my grandpa. You know, he wasn't your grandpa, and so it, this, this doesn't mean anything to you, but he was, he, he was my grandpa, and, and so that's why the worth, that's why it has the worth that it does. And so this morning, as we look at our text, we're going to see that the psalmist here seems to enjoy the intimacy and security from God that few people have ever really, truly known. And as a result of that closeness, there's really, there's, an, there's not many more upbeat or full of promise refrains in all the entire book of Psalms. And so let's all stand together this morning as we read these, just the first few verses of this psalm. The Word of God says this, He that dwelleth, in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. 
You know, in these verses, it becomes very plain, very evident to us that we're reading the words of a man who knew what, very personally what it meant to live in close fellowship with God. In fact, I would, and I would also dare say that most believers, maybe most of us in this room, would say that we want that closeness with God. Most of us would say that we want to experience uh, His presence and that we want to be more like Him. Yet I would dare say that fewer ever truly experience it. Or if they do, it's maybe just for a moment here or there or in particular moments of, of emergency. And they get, for times, do experience that, that season of closeness occasionally. But I'm afraid that there are many believers content, as we look at the phrase there, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, I'm afraid that there are many believers content to just hang out in the outer courts, in the peripherals. Uh, there, they don't, in fact, they don't even mind hearing about somebody who is, uh, lives in that secret place, somebody who has experienced the Shekinah glory. They might even enjoy hearing stories about it. But yet they're afraid to take that step for themselves into that holy of holies place. Uh, maybe it's, maybe I, I don't know what it is that keeps us from going there. Maybe, let's be honest, maybe it's a, a love of our own sin. Uh, maybe it's fear that keeps us from launching out and from stepping in there and dwelling in that place. Uh, maybe it's just out of plain laziness. Whatever it is, I'm afraid that so many believers miss out on the grace of God, the richness of the grace of God that only comes from dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Whoa, I just got cranked really high. All right, I think that's a little better. But what I want to talk to us about this morning is enjoying something that's so precious, so priceless, and yet oh so rare in our day. That is, that you and I would have such a relationship with our Creator, and so as to be able to say with, with all the honesty and with all the sincerity that we can muster, like we just read there in verse 2, that God is my God. You see that there in verse, the end of verse 2, it says, He is my refuge, uh, my fortress, He is my God. And so I ask you this morning, and uh, we'll pray here in just a moment, but I ask you, have you taken God to be your God? You know, I'm not just talking about just a name that gets, used, gets thrown around in church so much as to almost kind of almost lose its meaning. Uh, I, I, I've say, um, I'm asking you this morning, is He your God? And if He is then He must have a preeminent place in our hearts and our lives. And if He is our God, then that means that He will, that, that the, he will alter the way that we live out our lives. I think above all else, the thing that jumps out to me out off the page of, of this passage is where the psalmist here, and we don't know who he is, uh, that you would... It does, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly. It could be Moses. It could be David. But, it, but he boldly declares that God was his God. And this morning, the subject that we're going to talk about is this very thought. The fact, the fact that the very God of the Bible is my God. He is our God. And my desire is that every last person in this room this morning, that when we bow our heads and we pray and we close and we dismiss and go out these doors, that every last person can walk out of this room here and with full assurance and full confidence be able to say that the God that we read about here this morning, the God that we're going to take a look at, that we're going to examine, that that is my God. That's my desire for every single one of us this morning. And so let's pray. I have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the humbling privilege that it is to stand here this morning to open up the Word of God and to share a challenge from it. And Lord, I thank you for every person who took their time this morning. They got ready. They made the drive. They brought their kids. They did, did all the things necessary to, to be here at church this morning. And Lord, I thank you for that. I don't take that lightly. Lord, I pray that you bless them that, for that. 
But Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. I pray that you would help me to step out of the way for a few minutes. And I pray that, that your word would be magnified. And I pray that you'd be honored this morning. And Lord, we love you. We ask these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we get into the message this morning, really just two words. As you can see, the title of the message, My God, and, and it's really kind of a, uh, it'd be just two points. How many of y'all were here uh, a couple weeks ago for Big Bus Ministry Emphasis Night, and I crammed eight points <laughs> into uh, about 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. This morning, don't worry, I got two points. I, I, so really 10 points between two sermons kind of averages out, right? So um, <clears throat> two points this morning. And really, we're going to take those two little words, five letters, my God, and we're going to break that down. That's going to form the basis of our two points. And so the first point this morning is this, is my God. And let me ask you, what does it mean to be my God? How can we claim the creator of heaven and earth as our own? You know, what, what gives us that right? Well, can I say that we have that because God gave that to us. He himself said multiple times throughout the Word of God that, that he would be our God and that we would be his people. And so we would say that the, um, that, that happens at the very moment when we make the decision to believe on his son, Jesus Christ, and accept him accept his free gift of salvation and you and I become the children of God and we become we, we are born again and so that very moment we take on we he becomes our God and we become his as well the Bible does remind we're reminded over first Corinthians that we are bought with a price and therefore glorify God with our bodies and our spirits our gods and so we are his but but you know so we, we do become his and he becomes ours at that moment but can I say this morning that the sweetness of it, of, of him being my God, comes as that relationship is cultivated, as it begins to deepen. You know, it just doesn't, just, doesn't just happen overnight. It happens as you experience things together with God. It happens by time spent together. You know, Sarah's my wife, and, and she's my wife because of that moment where that day, 16 some odd years ago, where her and I uh, said, each of us said, I do, I do, I do, and, you know, uh, we became husband and wife. And, and so that, that it was, there was a moment there, um, you know, that day that we, um, you know, where she became my wife. But here's the thing, though. And again, we're talking about the, the sweetness of it. There's something a little different when you say, okay, yeah, that's my wife, just, just as a matter of factly. But there's something different when you say, hey, look at that girl. That's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that, that's my wife. You know? And, and then as, as, as I look at her, what happens, I begin thinking of memories that we've been able to share together. I begin thinking of the time that we, the times that we've spent, the, the vacations that we've been on, the, the good times, the, the, the mountaintops and, and, and the, the low valleys, the times we've cried together and the times we've celebrated together. Right? We're talking about that's the sweetness of a, of a relationship and it's more than just matter of factly saying that's my wife, but that's my wife. You understand what I'm saying? He's more than, yes, he is God. He is our God. But here's what we're talking about. And here's what we're going to get into our text this morning to, be, to being so much more than that. To saying that God, that's my God. That's my God. And the same thing that happens when you get to know the God of the Bible. I mean, when you really get to know him, something begins to happen. Yes, he's your Lord and Savior because of the day that you called on him. But, oh, but my friend, this morning, there's, when you've spent many of days walking in the cool of the morning with him, when, when you've cried with him, when you've celebrated over what he's done in your life, and, and when you've rejoiced and you've gone through the life experiences with God, there's something more that comes from it. And so, let me give you a couple reasons from our text <clears throat> this morning why we can say, He is my God. Let's look at our, the verse, verse 1. That first phrase says this, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Firstly, He's my God because He's my dwelling place. Misunderstand that 
the blessings, you know, we really just kind of scratch the surface of the blessings that are listed down through this psalm. We could take the time and, man, just go through it. We just don't have the time to itemize every single blessing that is listed. But I encourage you later on to study these out and see all the ways that God desires and that He does bless uh, those who trust Him. But we understand, though, that these, con these blessings were not just unconditional blessings. They're not offered, they're not for all believers, but are reserved for those who make it a pattern of their lives to live, to dwell, as the Bible says, in that secret place. Now, that, that word secret carries with it, it's the idea of, of, of a hiding place. You know, the, the psalmist, though, He's not, doesn't seem to really dwell on or in, in hit on the, the significance of where that place is. He doesn't really uh, reveal it to us or where that exact place is. And so I don't think necessarily the location matters. So I would say to us this morning, it doesn't necessarily matter where it is that you meet with God. For every person, that, that's going to look a little bit different. Maybe it's at your dining room table. Maybe you've got your chair you know, you're, you're in your living room. Uh, maybe it's in your bedroom. Maybe you like the outdoors and you just feel that you can be connected uh, to God there. But here's what is important. Is that that place exists. That you go there. That you get there. And beyond that, that you get there with some regularity. And that when you get there, you meet God there. Uh, that place dwelling. We're talking about dwelling in the secret place. And I'm thankful that, that God is my, he's my dwelling place. He's my God because he's my dwelling place. But more, so, more than that, let's look next and, down and jump down to verse 3. The Bible says this, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. You know, it's, we don't get very far into our text before we are called to remember that we have a very real enemy. The fowler, he's pictured as here. The fowler who's set on trapping us. And there's so much that we could say about the fowler, but can I say his identity? He's the same as that devil, that old serpent the, that we read about in Genesis and then we read about again in Revelation and all places in between. He's the roaring lion of uh, 1, Peter, 1 Peter 5 who walks about seeking him, whom he may devour. That's the fowler who's trying to set a snare for the believer. And the Bible does tell us that we're not ignorant of his devices. And, and we don't have the time this morning to talk about all the different ways that he snares, but we know that he does use all sorts of trickery, all sorts of deceitfulness to trap the unsuspecting believer. Yet for the one who dwells in the secret place, the one who takes the time, who's there, who is walking in closeness, we know that there's deliverance promise. So secondly, he's my, first he's my dwelling place, but secondly, he's my deliverer. And this reminds me really of Daniel. Daniel spent all night in the presence of a hungry pack of lions. And just think about that for a second. Try to put yourself there. Okay? I saw a video the other day, and I don't know why anybody would want to own a pet lion. But, but I, I, mean, I saw just a, a short video clip of this lion. This is some you know, rich guy from, I don't know, Saudi Arabia somewhere, some prince, some Saudi prince or whatever, and had this lion in his house. I mean, that thing was, help me understand just how massive these things are. And if you've ever been to a zoo or somewhere, you've seen, I mean, just how intimidating those things can be. But Daniel is condemned to be thrown into that den of lions with a, a, a pack or a pride, whatever you call it, a group of hungry lions, spends all night there. Darius, King Darius, the one who had been tricked, the king had been tricked into putting him there, spends all night worrying about Daniel. He, he feels terrible for what has happened. He knows Daniel's innocent. So what's he do the first thing of the next morning? He goes, he runs, and, and, and he has the stone pulled away, and, and he yells and says, hey, Daniel, is your God powerful enough to deliver you from the mouth of the hungry lions? And I love Daniel's response. Are you ready? Daniel chapter 6, verse 20, he says this. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths, and they have not hurt me. 
For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Listen to me this morning. You don't just walk away unscathed and unharmed from a den of lions and just flippantly say, yeah, yeah, God, God protect me. God, but no big deal. God, God watched out for me. No, no, no. I think Daniel at that moment and probably for a long time before that had, had such a closeness, had spent so much time dwelling in the secret place that he said, hey, that wasn't just God out there protecting me. That was my God protecting me. My God delivered me from the mouth of the lion. And, just, and so, listen, the, the, the deliverance that he experienced, the great goodness of God in supernaturally protecting him from being ripped limb from limb ignited something deep within the heart of Daniel, I truly believe. This was not just any God. This was his God. And so this morning, look, I've seen in my own family, in my own life, how God has... He has pulled me up out of the grasp of the lion. That devil who was bent on ripping me apart and ripping my family apart. And, and, and God picked us up. He dusted us off. He wiped us off and he gave us a second chance. He extended his grace and he extended his mercy to my family. He pulled us up out of there and he gave us a second opportunity to be trophies of his grace. My God is a deliverer this morning. I'm so thankful for a God who delivers us out of the mouth of the hungry lion. Man, he's my God because he's my deliverer. Verse 4, I'm sorry. <clears throat> he shall cover thee. Whew. This gets good. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Whew. And under his wings shalt thou trust. <clears throat> Here in these verses, we see God. If it wasn't for the word of God, it would almost kind of seem weird to, to picture God as a, as a mother hen, right? Because we know he's a father. He's the heavenly father. But, but we take the liberty to do so because the Bible does it. It says he's like a, a mother hen, a mother bird who takes her wings and takes her feathers and he protects. And so God is my God this morning because he's my defense. In verse 3, we saw that he delivers me from the fowler. In verse 4, we see he defends me from exposure. You see... This world has nothing to offer the Christian but heartache and regret. Let me say it one more time the, to you, to the children, child of God. This world has nothing to offer you. Has nothing for you. And so when I'm lured and I'm tempted out into the hurtful elements by its beauty and by its empty promise of pleasure and its empty promise of profit. Can I say, and thankfully this morning, I have a loving God who draws me back in. He's my defense. He said, hey, there's, that, there's nothing out there for you. You're only going to get hurt. My child, come back in. Come under the protection of my wings this morning. And you see, the more that I dwell with him, the more that he delivers me, the more that he is my defense, the more proudly that I can stand up here this morning and say, that's my God. That is my God. I love the, ver the words of that old hymn. I think it's the, uh, Bill Gaither maybe, I think, wrote it. But he says this, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, the more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. That is my God. Secondly, this morning, that's my God. What does it mean to be God? Can I say it's inexplicable, really? And it's more than just what we can, in a one point of a sermon, even begin to think about. And in any attempt, really be completely insufficient. But when we think of God and attempt to describe Him, one thing that we can do is look at His names. Because His names teach us something about His character and about His attributes. 
And so we look at our text, and, and you may or may not have noticed in those first couple of verses, but the author here uses four distinct names for God. Four names that are found all throughout Scripture. And so let's look at the first one. <clears throat> the Bible says this, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. That is God El Elyon, or Elyon would be the Hebrew there. That is this, God the High and Lofty One. Think of it this way, most of us in here, we have a boss. And then if you work for a giant corporation, your boss has a boss. And his boss has a boss. And so on and so forth as you move up the corporate ladder. So you get to the top and there's nowhere else to go. And you get the, the boss. Okay, only then have you just scratched the surface of what it means when, when the Bible says he is the high one. The buck stops with God. He reports to nobody. In fact, every person who's ever been created will report to him. One day, all of us are going to give account to that God, the lofty one, the most high. In fact, not only that, he says, hey, I, he's given his son a name, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And that, let me make sure I get it. <laughs> it's Philippians chapter 2. Sorry, i got to skip ahead here. Here we go. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. The first use, let's go, well, you don't need to turn there for sake of time this morning, but back in Genesis chapter 14, the first use of Elion, of the Most High, is found in Genesis 14, 18, and it's used in reference to Melchizedek. Not him, I'm sorry, but to the God that he served. And it says this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. The priest of Elion. You see, Abraham, he was obviously, he was the, the patriarch, the first patriarch that all the Jews looked to, they looked up to. And in, in Abraham, he gave his tithe to Melchizedek. And so if you were to look at it from, uh, from you know, uh, the hierarchy, essentially, you'd have all the Jews, and then they look up to Abraham, and then he tithed uh, to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, all he was, was a servant of the Most High God. And so, this morning, you may be sitting here, and with the same mindset that I'll just be honest that I've had in, in, in my own life in times past, thinking, man, I'm a red-blooded American male. I can, I can, this is my life. I can do what I want with it. Uh, I can, uh, I'm free to live however I please. I'm pre free to make the decisions that I choose. But can I kindly remind every one of us this morning that there is a God in heaven. Elion, the most high is his name. And he is the one to whom every last person will give account. My God is the most high. Secondly, let's continue on. He says this, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Almighty, that is El Shaddai. That name for God reminds us that He is the Omnipotent One. He is the All-Powerful, the Sovereign Almighty. And that tells us that His purposes will be accomplished. And there is nothing that anybody can do to interfere with him. And the first time we see this word, this name for God used in the Word of God, is also back in Genesis and also pertains to Abraham. But this time, God visits a 99 year old Abraham. He has already made at this point his covenant with Abraham. He's already promised that there would be a son directly with his uh, wife Sarah, that it would not be Ishmael, uh, that there would be a promised son. And God comes back to Abraham and reminds him of who he is. And he reminds Abraham of what he is going to do. And so you don't have to take your, uh, the time to turn there, but Genesis 17, the Bible says this, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram 
fell on his face, and God talked with him. And we'll just stop there. But I notice a couple of things when I see those verses. First off, is that when I'm confronted with the Almighty God, there are a couple of things that ought to be affected. And, and first off, my... my uh, my, the things that I do, the way that I walk should be affected. God says, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. When I come in face to face with an Almighty God, it's going to affect the way that I live. But then we see also, it ought to affect my posture. What was Abram's response? Abraham's response? Fell on his face when he recognized who he was when he was confronted, and we see not just here, but all throughout the Word of God, when people come, uh, when they are, 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 when they meet God, what is their first response? It's to fall on their face. And so, this, I want to remind us this morning that God is God Almighty. He is God, um, He's the omnipotent God, and there is nothing that is too hard for Him. He is capable and so I don't know what it is that you're asking God for this morning. But maybe the reason that you're here today is to re be reminded that the Almighty knows your need. Nothing will stand in the way, nothing can stand in the way of Him accomplishing His purposes in your life. And so I don't, again, I don't know what it is that you've been begging God for. And, and you've wondered, and there's obstacles that seem to be in the way of that. Can I say that our God, my God, is almighty this morning. Maybe we need to be reminded of that this morning. Continuing on, verse 2, he says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. You notice that word Lord there is in all caps, and that wasn't by accident. That is to signify that that's that Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. And the first time we see this word, I like going back to see, I think we learned some things, the law first mentioned. You can learn some things the first time that, that something's found in the Word of God. And so you, you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, and you see that for the very first time this name is introduced into the Word of God. The Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D, Jehovah. And it's interesting, in chapter 1, you know, Genesis 1-1, one, one, in the beginning, God created. And, and every time Moses, the author, the penman, the human penman, he uses the name God all throughout chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, verse 4, interestingly, after the first man and woman are created, he begins using this name, Lord God, because Jehovah is connected uh, with his relationship with humanity. And so from that point and forward in chapter 2, all throughout chapter 2, you see Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. It's just an interesting thing. Um, and then you have to go all the way to the next book of the Bible, Exodus, to get an explanation for what that name means. You fast forward hundreds of years, a long time, I don't know how long, uh, but you, in Exodus chapter 3, you have Moses. And he is standing before God, who has appeared to him in a burning bush. And, of course, if you're familiar with the, the Old Testament story, the, the Hebrews are in Egypt, and they've been there for some 400 years, and they're crying out to God for deliverance. They're, they're in a bad way. And, and God, who has already previously promised to deliver them, responds. And he says, he responds, and he's in the process in Exodus chapter 3 of sending Moses. And he says there, chapter 3, I'm sorry, one of the questions that Moses asks God was, hey, how, uh, when I go, how are the people to know, um, or how is he to respond, rather, sorry, when the people question, who is it that sent you, that sent me? And what does God say? I am that I am. So that's who sent you. And so from that name, that forms the basis of the Hebrew word Yahweh, that I am Yahweh. And we learn from this name that God is the self-existent one. Nobody made him. All that was, is, or ever will be originates with God. In fact, it's the most significant name for God and found over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. And so in Exodus 3, God tells Moses to remind the Hebrews that he was God of their fathers hundreds of years before. That he was God right now in their present distress. 
And then the verse goes on to say, And in every generation that would follow, I am still God. Sometimes we need that reminder. We, get, we think that our, our world is so big, our problems are so huge, that we forget that, hey, God has been God for an awful long time. He is God in your situation. He will be God uh, forever. In other words, he says, I was God, I will be God, I always and forever more am God. And so can I remind us this morning... It, it, it indicates his eternality, but it doesn't just indicate that word, that name Jehovah, his eternality, but also his activity. You see, he is actively at work. You see, the same God who would ultimately deliver Israel would be the same God of David and the same God of all of the prophets, and and he would be the same God uh, uh, that would that would rise Jesus from the dead. And, and, and as we move forward in the New Testament, the same God that would turn the world upside down in the book of Acts. He would be the same God uh, of the early church um, and the proliferation of Christianity. He would be the same God that would protect Christians down through the ages, the dark ages, as they face intense persecution. Can I say he's the same God of the great revivals that we study and we read about in times past, of, of Spurgeon and of Finney. He's the, he's the God of uh, the missions movements, the modern missions movement of William Carey and, uh, and, and Judson and Hudson Taylor and all those. Uh, he's, he was God, let me tell you this this morning, he was God 75 years ago when Beacon Baptist Church got its start. He was, he's God right now in this service. And when you and I are dead and gone and we're out of here and, and Lord willing, uh, this church will still stand that he will still be God. I'm thankful that He is God. He is Jehovah. My God is Lord. Then lastly this morning, we see in verse 2, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God. That is Elohim, that Hebrew word Elohim. And that's that in, He shows us that He is the infinite, all-powerful God who shows by His works that He's the creator, He's the sustainer, and he's the supreme judge of the world. We could say that this is the most general of the terms that have been used so far. <clears throat> One thing to note, though, when you see that name Elohim, is that the plural ending of that Hebrew word, that I am ending. And, and it shows us this, that, that not that... We are, that God is a polytheistic God, that there's many gods. It doesn't show a, a pluralistic of, a, hey, uh, like many other religions. No, it, 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 I, what I truly believe is that it opens the door for further revelation of God's triune nature. I believe it shows us that there are three persons, all contain one God, three distinct persons. Uh, of course, we know as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, all wrapped up in one God, that is Elohim. And here's what that tells me this morning. God the Father is mine. The loving Heavenly Father, man, the one who gave His Son, for God so loved the world, the, the God of John 3, 16. And, and I don't know where you're at this morning, spiritually speaking. I don't know if, if, if this is all foreign to you. Maybe you've, you've walked in here by the invite of, of a friend or somebody, a neighbor. But can I say that that, that God, God the Father, loves you. I, one of my favorite things to do when I'm, when I'm witnessing to somebody and giving them the gospel is to go to John 3, 16. And, and say, for God so loved the world. I say, well, it doesn't mean the world. He loves the grass and the trees and stuff. I mean, he does. But more importantly, he loves the people. It's talking about the people. So I'll take you, that person's name. I'll ask him for their name. I'll say, Kevin, for God, use, I use my name, for instance. For God so loved Kevin. And so I'm thankful that God the Father is mine, the, the loving Heavenly Father. I'm thankful that God the Son is mine this morning. The, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who loved me, who gave himself for me, my Redeemer uh, this morning. He, we are joint heirs with Christ, and I'm thankful this morning that God the Son is mine. Man, I'm thankful that the God the Holy Ghost is mine. God the Comforter. God the Convictor. And when, when I'm under the preaching of the Word of God, when I'm reading for my own, my own uh, benefit, and, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is convicting why, that's my Holy Spirit who's convicting me. And I'm, I'm thankful that He's God. He's the Holy Spirit. He's the earnest of my inheritance. He's that, that down payment, the fact that He's God in me for my salvation. 
God, my God, is the God. And so the only question that remains this morning as we kind of wrap it all up is this. Is He your God? Going back to this old knife, again, I mentioned it doesn't have a lot of monetary value, but it's priceless to me. Well, actually, I mentioned because it's my grandpa's knife, and so I keep it close. And just by way of kind of application this morning, this book, you can buy a cheap copy of this for a few dollars. In fact, I think you might still get them for a buck some places, a dollar twenty-five. I don't know. I've seen them really cheap. But you know, it doesn't, you can buy a copy of it real cheap. But when I, when I really get a hold and wrap my mind that God is my God, and I understand that I love my God, well, this is my God's words. This is my God's book. And so when I love my God and, I, and I'm dwelling in the secret place, I'm going to love His book. These are God's people. These are my God's people. And so who am I to go complaining about somebody else, about one of my God's people? He says, uh, by this token shall ye all the world know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Y'all are my God's people. And so I love my God, and so I love the people here. This is God's church. Who hey, am I to start bad-mouthing and start complaining? No, I love my God. My God loves His church. And so I better get on board with what His church is doing to reach the world for the, with the gospel. I love my God's church. And so, I, because I love my God, is He this morning the God of your life? Let's close out in a word of prayer. I ask Maria to come play for us this morning. Whoever, yeah, Maria, play for us, please. A word of invitation.